So welcome to you all. And as we begin, I would like to offer a karakia to open up our space today. So please just use this as a moment to put aside the rest of your day, to empty your busy mind and to get yourself ready and prepared to receive the experience of this conversation that we're about to have. As a bicultural nation, Aotearoa New Zealand culturally includes practices like the karakia, which draws from the wisdom of Tia Māori, the indigenous world of the land of Aotearoa. So I'm going to do a karakia. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i waho, tu tawa mai i roto. Kia tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora, Ki te katoa, homie, huie, taikie. In English, this means I summon from above, below, within, and the environment outside us all today to calm us and settle us and settle our vital inner essence and create a well being space for all of us to be joined together as one. Karakia is a sacred opening which aligns our group and prepares the mood and the focus of our conversation today. So again, thank you for being present with us as we enter into this environment. Kia ora e te whanau, ko Chelsea toko ingoa. Welcome family, my name is Chelsea. Uh, I hail from the Waitakere's of Tamaki Makaurau, which otherwise known as West Auckland in New Zealand. I'm currently residing in a different mountain range, which is the Sierras of the uh, border of Nevada and California. My experience personally is uh, all over the show, but includes the space industry, the environmental management sector, climate policy, mental health, and democracy. I'm a cohort seven Edmund Hillary fellow, and I'm going to be chairing today's conversation. We are gathered here in this meeting as part of a wider event that a lot of you will already know about, but for those who don't, this is part of the EHF Springboard, an online conference of high caliber with incredible fellows bringing their views from around the world to bear on many, many different topics. This specific event today is entitled Leveraging the Unique Position of New Zealand. We are joined by two esteemed speakers, Gary Hirschberg and Will Marshall, both fellows within the EHF community. Their experiences draw from insights in the space industry, in agriculture, food, data, and land management, all highly relevant to the development of the New Zealand economy. This panel is special because it's actually sort of an outside looking in angle. So bringing Gary and Will's views to the question of what is that special thing that New Zealand can be doing based on what you can see um, from, from close up and from afar. This event is 90 minutes long and we will hear from both of our speakers in regards to their personal stories, some comments on their work and their experience and shift also into a Q&A. I do have some prompts ready up my sleeve for this Q&A, but it is also very, very much an opportunity for all of you on the phone today to submit your questions and prompts via the Q&A function of Zoom or in the chat. Um, and as I mentioned that, those who will be checking those include Michelle from the EHF team. Hi, Michelle and Paula as well. Both of them are at the ready. If anyone has any issues, please feel free to ping Michelle and Paula. So without further ado, I would just want to invite Gary and Will to share a little bit of personal story. I want to know, you know, a little bit more background. Who are you holistically? How did you grow up? What's some important parts of your journey that you've been on? So I'll invite you to take about five to seven minutes per person to actually just let us know who you are. We've got time. So let's let's really dig in. Gary, I'm going to invite you to go first, actually. Oh, I was just offering to Will. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chelsea and uh, Kiara Tefano. Uh, I am Gary Hirschberg. I'm in uh, quite cold New Hampshire in the Northeast US. I'm about halfway between uh, New York and Montreal. Um, and as you know, um, our country is in quite a mess right now with COVID. Uh, we're all quite isolated. I live on a beautiful lake in the mountains here. So I'm, I think I'm grateful every day for, for um, my isolation and very sad for what is going on with my fellow country people. Um, although I will say, as you can see from the sign in the back, I'm quite happy about the election, which finally seems to be over. And we'll, I'm sure, talk about that. 
in a little bit. Um, my background is I grew up here in New Hampshire. It was when I was a child, it was a rural state. It was a state where I knew the farmers all around me. We, our holiday hams and turkeys and rabbits were from farmers around us. And all of that kind of disappeared in my childhood. I, um, the land became very suburbanized and um, I was a ski racer. I, I spent most of my time outdoors and uh, over the course of my childhood, I realized we were really uh, doing severe injustice to our, our planet, certainly to my state. And so I wound up studying uh, climate change, particularly uh, as evidence of climate change at tree line, at the edge of where um, trees end and, and Arctic or Alpine environments begin. I actually studied dendroclimatology. And actually, this was my first exposure to New Zealand because the world's leading dendroclimatologist was a Kiwi. Uh, and I, 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 he studied and, and uh, worked in Christchurch. And so New Zealand got planted in me very, very early and very young. Uh, though it wasn't until um, many years later, about 20 years ago, that I first finally uh, got over. And uh, along the way, I ran a, an ecological research institute in the 70s, uh, doing integrated um, scientific approaches to food and agriculture and waste treatment, trying to look at ways to eliminate our footprints. We were talking about things back then that nobody really understood um, uh, that are now very commonplace today. And uh, when Ronald Reagan came, and I, I was the director, so I had to raise all the money. And when Ronald Reagan became president in 1981, we learned just how uh, vulnerable we were to the political winds because all the federal funding for renewable energy, organic research, all of it disappeared literally in the first days of that administration. And our problem was we had advanced a lot of beautiful science and shown uh, how organic and integrated organic uh, aquaculture, agriculture all could work in harmony with the earth and be very productive, but we hadn't really developed the economics. And so out of desperation, my institute and many others started uh, down the business path. We began by consulting and developing ways of getting paid for our work. Uh, and I joined the board of a little organic farming school with seven cows uh, where the, my partner um, made a beautiful yogurt. And we decided one day to start selling the yogurt, or organic yogurt to uh, make ends meet. And today that company, which I ended up leading for 30 years is Stonyfield Farm. It's the world's largest organic yogurt company. And of course, the organic sector has grown. We, we couldn't even use the words organic and sector back when we started in the early 80s. And uh, to make a very long story short, because we'll get into it, and I want to hear from Will, uh, I, I appeared in a film called Food, Inc., which really looked at the, um, uh, the problems with conventional food systems and the opportunities in, in more ecological approaches. And, uh, the um, Organic Association of New Zealand invited me over, as I said, about 20 years ago to present the film. And that's where the hook got in. And uh, uh, today I own a farm in, just south of Mochueca in Natamoti, and I'm building an organic entrepreneurship center uh, where I'm looking to, well, we're, we're certifying the land now. It's about 180 acres. I'm looking to model not only organic growing methods like we used back in the 70s and 80s here, but also organic business methods to help the next generation learn how to um, make economic sense of all of this. And uh, I run an entrepreneurship institute that we just actually had it last week where uh, hundreds of New Zealand uh, entrepreneurs can learn also these methods. So anyhow, I'm delighted to be with you all and look forward to sharing more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. That was a wonderful highlight tour across a, a life so rich with experiences. Yeah, exactly. So thank you so much. Um, Will, I would love to invite you, for those of you who don't know, Will and I are friends. Um, Will sits on the board of the organization that I work with and is also a co-founder of the organization I work with. So um, we know each other reasonably well, but Will, I wanted to just give you the chance as well to tell your story. Where did you grow up? What's your path been in a nutshell? Please, please tell us a little more. 
Sure. Um, well, I'm uh, speaking to everyone here from San Francisco, and um, my passions since a kid uh, uh, were in space and astronomy, um, and then separately in nature and uh, animals and care for animals, and have a deep sense of uh, justice uh, that I care about for nature. Um, and that will get tie into some of the, the interests I have in uh, uh, New Zealand and the and 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 what they have been doing recently in in that which is evolving to to give rights to ecosystems and that's an important passion of mine. But the space geekery part of my um, uh, life took more of a hold early on, and uh, it went into astronomy and went and then into um, um, uh, um, actually deviated a little bit into theoretical physics with quantum physics, and then. For my PhD, and then went uh, worked at NASA for a number of years on planetary missions. Looking, uh, sent a couple of probes to the moon with some colleagues at NASA, uh, looking for water there. We found water there, uh, which was really exciting at the time uh, because the moon had thought to be dry. But um, actually, it's quite interesting if you have water there; it makes it much more tractable to um, uh, set up bases there and things like that, which is something that. Uh, um, Chelsea and I talk a fair bit about, um, uh, but uh, I've become much more interested in the earth um, and the earth ecosystems than anything out there far out, although I you know, was building telescopes since I was about 16, so it wouldn't have been surprising uh, that I would still be building telescopes at 42, uh, but looking down to helping us take care of the earth now, uh, rather than looking up and trying to understand how the universe works. Um, because I think that's where we got to focus our energies and and uh, technology can play a critical role um, in, in doing that. And uh, so when we left NASA, my, my co-founders and I and our team that we uh, dragged along with us, not kicking and screaming, they actually loved it, um, yeah, to build satellites to take care of the Earth. It was a sort of uh, culmination of stars aligning towards our interests for taking care of the earth ecosystems and you know the strong needs on the planet to to have the data to manage that um, you can't manage what you don't measure and um, the satellites can play an important role in that um, I think it's critical what we we're talking about here about the about technology for the earth and I don't think um, one should really be pursuing technology unless it has a, a cr critical and absolutely clear role to help us um, it shouldn't be developed for its own sake. And I say that as a space geek, I could geek out with you about all sorts of like space technology that I have a passion about personally and technically, but it's not relevant unless it's actually helping us advance as a species or protect ecosystems. And that's, that's where really Planet um, was founded upon the, the ethos of. And uh, um, so now we, we, we have a lot of cameras up. I can explain a little bit more in the next section about that, but like we have a lot of cameras helping us hopefully to take care of the planet. Mm. Thanks, Will. A lot of cameras indeed. And you will all hear a lot more about Planet, but if you don't haven't if you don't know about it already and you haven't heard about it before, please do check out planet.com as per what Will was just describing. And I'm sure there'll be more there too. Gary and Will, have you ever met each other before or is this our first yep. interaction? This is fantastic. Yep. So I had the chance to spend a week with Gary in the South Island of New Zealand about a year ago, which was fantastic. Um, and Will, we've obviously spent some time together too. So I'll just say I'm so excited to hear how the overlap between your two views can really, you know, dig out some nuance in the interface between managing the lands that we all love and care for and the life that lives in them. Uh, and also do that with, with data at scale without losing the integrity and importance of the local. So uh, I'm really, really thrilled for this. So as we really get into the meat of the discussion, I do just want to let you both sort of state where you're coming from with the work that you do and with the view that you have. Um, so again, I'll just invite you to take with it five, seven, ten minutes per person to really give us a fleshed out view of where are you coming from, what are you working on, and where do you bring to bear um, your views on the topic of how we leverage New Zealand's unique position in the world. So um, whichever one of you would like to start, go for it. Um, if you go wildly over time, I'll let you know, but otherwise uh, we have got time. So so please feel free to dig in. And yes, then we'll will. Go ahead. Okay, I'm uh, um, happy to Gary, and it is nice to meet you. Um, so. Uh, I would say a few things. So look, as I said, I think the tech for Earth sort of theme of this panel is 
is is great and it's critical that we use technology to advance ourselves and i like what you were just saying chelsea about doing so on a systematic and global scale whilst understanding the local needs like i think one of the beauties of our present technologies is that it can actually tie those things together so it can be both local and global at the same time and we have the power and tools to do that these days and it's a big moment for technology um because we've seen i think you know, we, we've obviously got an incredible array of technologies at our disposal and fingertips, but at the same time, there's never a greater need for it um, uh, because we're in a global crisis. Um, and that's, uh, and I'm not talking about the pandemic, um, which of course is a global crisis um, and a, a terrible one at that, uh, but I'm talking about the crisis of our age, of our generation, of the environmental catastrophe. And by the way, I'm not talking about climate either, uh, because that's a common misunderstanding of what is going on on the planet. Uh, the climate doesn't give a shit. Uh, we, we, what we should care about is um, the animals and the species that are dependent on it. And uh, biodiversity loss is the crux of the issue. Um, biodiversity loss is uh, actually being driven primarily not by climate, it's by being driven primarily by land use change. Um, uh, it's been driven by us cutting down forests uh, in favor of agricultural lands. It's been driven by overfishing. It's been driven by human activity, but not related to carbon. The carbon and the climate is an important factor and it's sort of the third most important factor and it's growing. And so I don't mean to suggest by any means that we don't need to take into account emissions. In fact, that's uh, you know crucial and coming up. But I think it's missing the point in that uh, the thing that we actually care about and, and the, you know the, the planet has seen various climate climatic changes back and forth um, much greater than we've seen not as dramatically fast as we've seen except for extreme events like um, uh, after asteroid hits but the but the in, it, but the biodiversity loss is just staggering and it's clearly human created and it's already happened um, 68 percent uh, just to give you a few figures 68 percent of all life on the earth has gone uh, and it's gone in our last, uh, in my lifetime, in the last 40 years. Uh, these are UN reports. Uh, basically, 82% of wildlife on land has gone, 75% of fish in rivers and, and freshwater lakes, uh, over 70% of insects gone, over whole half of the coral reefs gone. These are not hypothetical future scenarios. They are the already gone uh, part. Now that's very depressing and of course, uh, but technology can actually really systematically help with these things. And, and one of the other brilliant things and something we've seen a little bit of a uh, window into in 2019 is the, uh, the fact that nature can bounce back really strongly. When I talk about 68% of life gone on the planet, I'm not talking about by species, actually by species it's much less, which is good. I'm talking about by volume and uh, nature can bounce back if you, afford her the opportunity. I love this Gary Larson cartoon that came out this year, um, which basically had in 2019, all the, all the humans were looking at the animals in the zoos. And, and in 2020, all the animals were walking through the streets with the, anim with the humans being locked in their houses because uh, of COVID. And nature did bounce back and come into our streets. And we were more interested in seeing nature. And, and I think there's an even more than that psychology sort of effect going on, which I find an exciting silver lining to the coronavirus situation. Of course, we won't want on the planet at all, but since we have it here, one of the fantastic things I see is that we've shown ourselves our ability to react and significantly change our behavior at scale um, when we choose to. And what comes to my mind as a sort of thought experiment is had the 68% of life on the planet been wiped out in four months like coronavirus came on rather than 40 years, as in fact it did happen, would we be reacting with a kind of emergency scale efforts that we have for coronavirus? And I rather think we would. And therefore this, 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 uh, is, uh, this coronavirus situation has been enabling us to flex our muscles of emergency response. And now we have to turn ourselves to the, uh, the crisis and global emergency of our age of the biodiversity loss and that's going to, you know, but, but we've shown what we can. We actually need to fly less, but not nearly as much less as we already just did. Uh, we need to change our behavior, but in some senses, not as much as we have. We need to, you know, get used to remote work. And that's, you know, it's not exactly the same, of course. And um, we've got to do things like 
be willing to eat more plant-based diets. We do have to fly, fly less. Uh, we do have to change some of our practices. But on the scale of it, it's not as dramatic as not seeing one's loved ones for eight months or uh, things like this. It's actually, um, these are doable changes. And now we've shown that we can do it. Anyway, that's a bit of a like a prelude into tech for the earth and what we're here for. Let me tell you a little, few words about Planet, um, which is the company um, that I uh, represent and, 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 and its connection with New Zealand as well. So, so the what and the why is sort of in brief, um, a Planet, uh, what we've done is launched a large fleet of Earth imaging satellites. So these are cameras in orbit taking pictures of the Earth. And, um, and, uh, and, and what they do is uh, it, we have two systems, one that scans the entire land mass of the planet at 3.5 meter resolution once per day. So all the land mass, every single point on New Zealand, every point on, on the entire land mass, plus nearby coastal waters um, uh, once a day at 3.5 meter resolution and with all these different spectral bands that help us to assess things like um, crop health and, and, and biodiversity loss and these things like this. Um, so it's tracking wide scale change, what you need to manage various ecosystems amongst other things. Um, and we have another system of satellites uh, uh, which zoom in and can have up to 50 centimeter resolution and can take pictures up to 10 times per day, but a task system. Uh, so basically these, these tools um, uh, uh, produce data and then uh, we sit on top of that a whole bunch of analytical work so that we can build that and pull out roads and buildings or, or ships and planes from that data in an autonomous way so that the millions of images we get every day is quite a fair uh, 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 amount of data um, can be processed and understood. Um, so now we have erected that system. We set ourselves this goal of imaging the whole earth every day about eight or nine, or nine and a bit years ago now. And we uh, achieved that a couple of years ago. We now have 1300 images on every point in the land mass of the earth. We have 150 satellites. Um, it was the largest satellite fleet ever launched until SpaceX recently built beat us a little bit with their satellites, although I think we're still the largest operational uh, satellite fleet. Um, and why are we doing it? Well, it's all to do with the, uh, you know, earlier comments about protecting biodiversity. You can't manage what you can't measure. And the first step in our evolution in the, in the, the global transition, the global economic transition to a sustainable economy, whether you're a company doing ESG targets, as like monitoring your supply chains, what have you, or whether you're a country measuring climate targets, or whether you're a bank measuring green bonds, you need to measure all of those systems that those things depend upon. And so we have to measure our forests, we have to measure our coral systems, we have to measure our, uh, our, our, our key by diverse, biodiverse regions and so on. And so we're trying to do that on a systematic scale. I can give you a few examples of that, like in coral reefs and deforestation, if people are interested. Our connection to New Zealand is, uh, in addition to launching all these satellites, well, some of them got launched in New Zealand. We were the first customer of the company Rocket Lab, which is based uh, in New Zealand, which has nano rockets. Um, we bought their first set of rockets because we buy lots of rockets. Uh, that's one of the things we do. And uh, so we were their first customer and had the first satellite on one of their early launches and recently launched more. And we've got another set of launches coming up with them. Um, and we also build ground stations down in the very southern tip of New Zealand, where we have um, some in Arurua, um, it's a very southern tip of the southern island, uh, um, which um, because we're trying to send them as far north and south in latitude. And so New Zealand is one of the spots uh, we've got around the world. We have about 50 of these around the world and a couple of them in New Zealand. And um, and uh, but finally, and most importantly, in my mind, um, which is why I apply to EHF, um, uh, is how we might be able to work with the New Zealand government on its progressive policies to do with um, monitoring ecosystems, giving rights to ecosystems. So that cup is, is coupled and hand in hand with the data piece that you can enable those sorts of policy uh, policies with. And so I, I believe there's a strong connection there. I'm really pleased that the EU has put forward its EU a sustainable transition uh, plan through the Green Deal. Um, and that's sort of the very centrist and, and very powerful at scale. But I think New Zealand is more at the cutting edge of the bleeding edge of what could be done in the next generation of thinking around climate. So um, that's a little bit about what we do at Planet and, and how it connects to uh, tech for us. Awesome. Thanks, Will.
again, a lot of territory covered there, but you did a great job of kind of opening all of that up, helping us see all of those different layers. Um, a few people are asking questions and uh, just sort of chiming in in the chat. So feel free to go in there if you'd like to sure. uh, have a chat with those folks. And Gary, I'd love to invite the same. So what, what's your work right now? How does it fit into this COPAPA, this topic of today? Uh, thank you. It's really difficult, Chelsea, because I actually want to just talk to Will now. <laughs> but I will, I will do my best to put some more data out there. You can do that so, in a few minutes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, to connect the dots, um, you know, as I said, I, I, I wound up uh, being a, somebody who spent a lot of time at Treeline. I was very, I was fascinated by the uh, warming of the planet and the kind of fundamental mythologies that underlay, you know, that humans, you know, the rights that we gave ourselves to do this damage. And of course, I couldn't agree with, more with Will about the bio biodiversity as being the, 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 the really the epitome. I mean, actually extinguishing life. It's just, you know, audacious to say the least. And um, along the way in my work on climate, I discovered that uh, organic methods of growing uh, of agriculture of all sorts uh, sequester far more carbon than uh, non-organic methods. And specifically, um, that there is really no way to reverse climate change. I mean, stopping or slowing it even the 70s was already absurd. What we really needed to do was reverse it. And that meant taking carbon and other carbon warming gases out of the atmosphere and putting them back in. And that's what organic does every day. And so that led me to go to work at this institute, which I mentioned. And, um, you know, as a general overview, I would just say I've, I've kind of I came into Stonyfield in my business life after many years of proving the efficacy of these um, uh, pro-biodiversity, carbon sequestering, water quality improving, water uh, volume saving technologies uh, with, a, with sort of a notion of three myths that govern human behavior. One is uh, and I call them the modern day myths. One is that the earth is a subsidiary of our economies, um, which is of course exactly 180 degrees wrong. Actually all economics is, has been made possible by a bountiful earth. We just have it backwards. Um, secondly, that the earth is infinitely resilient to handle whatever we throw at it. And you just heard from Will and from me, there's ample evidence that that's wrong. And then the third, and this is what led me into business and what will lead me to New Zealand in a moment, um, is this idea that externalities, uh, you know, the direct consequences of our economic behavior as a species, our social behaviors are real, but because they don't appear in our profit and loss statements or our balance sheets or in our markets, they don't exist in, in, in economic terms. Nobody's accountable. And so uh, my last 36 years has been about proving the economics, the economic advantages of ecological food production, ecological skincare products, ecological, uh, just whole system thinking about commerce. And what I'm trying to do right now is to bring a 21st century market view to New Zealand. And I'll explain why. Um, you know, the idea here is for me, my own work is to use my institute, which I run, as I mentioned, with hundreds of entrepreneurs training and teaching and helping them with cash flow, raising money, uh, uh, measuring these uh, other other uh, non heretofore unmeasured uh, impacts of our businesses, and turning those into pro positive marketing uh, communications. But also, I'm trying to use this farm, as I mentioned, to be a real model for commerce as well as for ecological methods, and. Um, you know, I want to be clear, uh, I see some, some very unique and extraordinary opportunities for New Zealand social and environmental entrepreneurs, but I want to be very clear that I'm not naive about the actual gap between New Zealand's perceived and actual greenness. I call it the high talk do ratio. Uh, but, 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 but the fact that there is our global perception of a, a green advantage here is, is something significant that should be capitalized upon. And to be clear, there's a lot of work to be done to help 
New, New Zealand live up to your green reputation, but there's a lot here. Uh, New Zealand has abundant natural resources, a strong independent entrepreneurial spirit. As an island nation, there's lots of innate creativity that comes from learning to live within limits. Uh, the high cost of shipping in and out forces more creativity. A strong national awareness of the threats of climate and, and uh, 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 attacks on biodiversity and a need to really alter our behaviors. And of course, on the farming side, there's lots of grass-based protein production, which is far more uh, carbon and, and uh, life uh, conserving than the other way. Uh, there is, as Will mentioned, a progressive government that we certainly cannot take for granted here in the States. Uh, that, for instance, has not capitulated to chemical companies' pressures on uh, GMOs, for example. And I chaired the national campaign to label GMOs here in the U.S. So I know how pernicious these companies are and how astonishing it is that New Zealand has withstood that uh, those forces. And as I say, most importantly, there's a global perception of green that other nations would kill to cultivate. And so before I go right to those opportunities and risks at, in New Zealand, let me just say a little bit more about the market conditions that I, as I mentioned, I'm trying to help promote uh, awareness of this. Um, just to be clear, since 2000, the organic sector globally has grown at about 14% annually. Um, that is uh, astonishing. Uh, it's 14 times faster than conventional uh, uh, non-organic uh, production. And I'm talking about personal care as well as food and beverage. Um, uh, the U.S. natural and, uh, and organic products industry is continuing, particularly during COVID, as people have become much more aware of health and preventative health and avoiding toxins, another huge factor in, in uh, our biodiversity challenges. Uh, and so this year, again, in the U.K., in the U.S., uh, organic grew far, far faster, four or five times faster than non-organic. 82% um, of American households now purchase some organic products. And so um, what's behind these trends, time doesn't really allow, but I'll just say there's some obvious sticks in, in, in that there's incredibly compelling health and environmental data favoring uh, or uh, you know, regarding the costs of conventional uh, agriculture and favoring, non, uh, favoring more sustainable or regenerative or organic. And generally, and here's getting to the kind of heart of my of the opportunity, generally millennials, the, 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 the gen that is now the primary target of most advertising, most focus of most business, uh, has shown the fastest uh, growth and the highest consumption of these more uh, transparent, more green approaches to uh, products. So uh, this is an, uh, there's no surprise here, this is an audience that uh, unlike my generation, I'm 66, uh, does not need to be taught about climate change, biodiversity, toxins, animal health, uh, uh, water pollution, and other consequences. And of course, there's plenty of carrots to match the sticks. We know, for example, with organic methods, animals live twice as long. Farmers and farm families are less exposed to toxins. Uh, more successful pregnancies. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on this studies galore now that weren't there when we started 35 years ago that show that, um, you know, for example, a, a study that followed 70,000 adults for five years in France showed that uh, the one, the most frequent consumers of organic foods had 25% fewer cancers than those that never ate organic foods, which means that, you know, when you understand that in America, we, we have this national debate going on about supposedly healthcare, but it's not about healthcare. It's actually about sickness care. It's about the treatment side. And really the cheapest form of healthcare is prevention. And to come to the point and to really dovetail with Will, uh, what we now know about these consumers is that they, the carrots of better sequestration of nutrients. We, we know side by side, Massey University in New Zealand has shown this, uh, leading land grant universities in the States have shown it and abroad in Europe that, uh, as I mentioned, organic farms sequester and trap more nutrients because there's more biological life using those nutrients, side-by-side -side farms. There's no nitrogen runoff on organic farms. There's enormous nitrogen runoff on conventional as New Zealand is, is addressing right now. 
Um, as I said, far more biodiversity. The, the 35,000 acres where we grow our organic sugar has had 300 species return to these farms from uh, hundreds and hundreds, uh, several hundred insects to pumas, uh, cougars, uh, large cats, because the whole food chain has become healthy. Um, and so uh, this is all to say that there's a market demand now for this kind of thing. And I, I, I just wanna mention quickly, there's uh, been very recent consumer data, but it's been building all along, backing me up on this, a survey that was done this fall of a thousand uh, diverse Americans weighted by age and gender and region showed that 77% of those surveyed now say personal health is more important today than it was even two years ago. No surprise with COVID. But 67% said environmental health is more important today than it was two years ago. Uh, at grocery stores, there's rampant data that consumers are paying more attention to food waste, plant-based foods, responsible meat, seafood, dairy, buying organic, buying products with environmentally friendly packaging and so forth. And so um, what we know, just a couple of stats before I bring it right home to New Zealand, 69% of consumers now, again, this is rich, poor, urban, rural, north, south, uh, uh, racially diverse, 69% of consumers believe it's important to know how their food was produced. 60% wanna know if an animal is given hormones. 67% of consumers want more information on packaging. These data did not exist when I started in business. Um, and I could go on and on, but you get the gist. So let me come to the, the punchline here and, and, and the point of my, uh, my work. Um, first, regardless of whether New Zealand entrepreneurs want to take care of, take advantage of export opportunities, there are just enormous ecological and economic advantages to increasing the acreage of, of sustainable, organic, regenerative methods. Um, you are less dependent on importing goods to subsidize the soil. Uh, I'm doing this on my very own farm with composting. Uh, you get cleaner waters, better watersheds, more wildlife, which means more natural pest and insect controls, uh, better farmer and farm worker health, better economics, animals live twice as long, and again, better overall health. So if my contention, my thesis is that if New Zealand can document and substantiate its greenness. And again, this is a, you know, a lot of work to be done here, that this will become a competitive 21st century advantage for food and personal care and houseware. Um, and people say, well, what about the long distance, the shipping? I can tell you from a total carbon footprint as the first co uh, consumer product company in America to measure our whole footprint I can tell you that shipping, particularly by, by boat, is negligible compared to how it's grown, how it's produced. Um, New Zealand is far from these markets, but to Will's point, using technology, as we are doing today, look at all the time zones joined tonight, um, digital and social media eradicate those differences. A consumer in New York can see her lamb uh, growing uh, on the South Island or bees producing the Manuka honey in her favorite skin cream. Um, 40 years in business, if I was gonna summarize my entire business trajectory, it's this, is that I, I had much poorer gross margins because I actually paid farmer, farmers a proper price to grow things ecologically. And so my cost of goods was much higher, literally twice as high as non-organic. But I didn't have to spend as much on advertising because I used social media bloggers influencers opened up the transoms of transparency to actually invite my farm my consumers to visit our farms meet the farmers and understand what's going on and and that gives you when the consumer can see what's going on there's something much more powerful than a left brain motivation and purchasing there's the emotional power and that gets you loyalty which is the most powerful purchase influence there is and so um We'll get in, I'm sure, in the Q&A into some of the current legal, uh, uh, there's some very positive legal developments and, and legislative developments in New Zealand mm -hmm. that are favoring this. But the key is really to help producers seriously uh, see the benefits of these kinds of approaches to growing. And I think 
there's no better laboratory on earth than uh, to do this than, than New Zealand. Wonderfully said, Gary. Nicely rounded out at the end there. Yes, I mean, I just want to affirm briefly that, you know, as someone who's worked on climate change, science and policy for some time, I mean, the consumer demand piece, I think I would put at, at a personally a little bit of a lower um, importance, but I understand that, you know, any, any food business um, is going to be thinking about that intensely. And I think like what you were just saying at the end there, this feedback loop between consumer demand and political appetite. And so, you know, we need to leverage that feedback loop as, as much as we can to get both the top down and the bottom up expression of change that we need to see. So fantastic. Thank you for giving that overview. Um, I want to start shifting us into some sort of faster paced dynamic back and forth q and I have a little list of questions here. Um, I feel like you actually kind of answered the first question that I was going to ask you, Gary, which is really about what some of these market demand opportunities mean for New Zealand. So I'm going to go right into a question that I have queued up for Will and then come back to you, Gary. So Will, the question that I want to ask you is quite sort of a mirror image to some of the topics Gary was just mentioning. The question really is sort of tapping into your experience in the satellite imagery context what are the promising examples of how New Zealand can leverage that work to inform better environmental decision making? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, that's, that's the, the eye in the sky. How, how do we actually use that information to guide those choices, um, especially in the New Zealand context? What do you think of that? Yeah, well, my, my, my mind immediately jumps to agriculture. Um, but um, let me just say that, I mean, I think it's important, important to think about these things as as, as connected with challenges on the ground. And if it's not, again, like there's no point doing it, um, but how does it help local people? And we've actually seen some really novel use cases of our imagery amongst um, the agricultural communities in New Zealand, including uh, measuring the height of grass to know when to move cows from one field to another, which I'd never heard of before in my entire life. So that was a new one. Um, we, we do use our data quite a bit in agriculture, normally for monitoring crop health and yield to then improve efficiency, which is important for multiple reasons, including feeding the planet and stopping the pressure on the deforestation. But the particular thing that comes to my mind is sustainable agriculture and regenerative agriculture and whether or not we can monitor those practices from space and whether um, New Zealand can be a sandbox for experimentation in that domain. So, for example, um, We've got to move to less uh, tilling practices and more from monocrops to polycrops and a few other sort of practices. And I'm not an agriculture expert, but just reading a little bit about um, uh, sustainable and regenerative agriculture points you in that kind of direction. And we can actually monitor that from space. Um, some of those things um, um, uh, we have, and we have a lot of academics that use our data to back up these claims, but. Um, but you, and that's mainly so far have been on the traditional agriculture and just improving yields, which is an important thing in of itself, as I said, for the pressure on the on reducing the pressure on on the on forests. Um, but but in terms of sustainable agriculture, we're just early on in the phase of understanding this. But it seems pretty self-evident that we'll be able to uh, uh, monitor from from space the tilling practices um, and and uh, whether or not there's polycrops poly crops or monocrops uh, practices being used and therefore it could be an experimentation for that. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to my mind. The second thing that comes to my mind is key biodiverse areas and New Zealand has a few. Um, if you look at keybiodiverseareas.org, I think the site is, it's this uh, part of the ICUN, uh, the, the International, International Conservation Union that, you know, I can't remember exactly the acronym, but they, they put out this, like, where are the key biodiverse regions? The areas where there's the biggest, uh, both uh, density of all the different species type and risks um, from encroachment and other things that are driving biodiversity loss. And of course, conservation, both of forests and of especially the key biodiverse regions of forests and other wetlands and coastal areas, protection of these things and and also marine parks is is is, is critical and uh, so um, we see our role there in tracking and stopping deforestation we did a big project um, with the government of Norway a few weeks ago tracking all the uh, deforestation in the 64 tropical countries we haven't yet applied it to New Zealand um, but we should um, and uh, we also did a project last year on uh, doing the first map of all the 
um, coral reefs around the planet, which I had surprised to find that had never been mapped before singularly, but also um, then revisit them every day to track and stop um, illegal fishing, to have early signs of ocean bleaching. Actually, his first sort of report started coming out just last week on that, like where it's like here preemptively, there's some ocean bleaching, what can we do? And so these are the alert systems. Here's a deforestation here, encroachment here, uh, illegal fishing here, um, bleaching over here. Uh, that enables us to then and, uh, do policy enforcement um, with a, whether a coast guard stopping the illegal fishing vessel or a forest uh, or police force going in and stopping illegal deforestation. Having that quick learning loop between those um, data and action is why I see an opportunity, especially in the sustainable agriculture space, but also in the conservation space um, being the uh, first things that come to my mind. Yeah, you awesome, know, Will. Could I, can you, could I just sorry, Gary, can I ask? Uh, can I ask oh, a quick follow-up? Because there's a, there's a bit of a theme yeah. happening in the chat and also in my mind. Will, can you just make it a bit more explicit how those relationships, ha 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 how they're structured? So, for example, like people have been asking, um, like, ha how do people get access to that data? And I don't necessarily need you to, you know, roll out the full explanation, but just a couple of examples of are they government relationships? Are they private partnerships? Ha how does that occur based on what you were just describing? Yeah, I mean, we, we have various different relationships with all of the above happen. Um, so we, we uh, mostly sell our data to governments, to private companies that buy our data for the various different purposes, like agricultural companies to improve agricultural efficiency. Um, we also provide it to NGOs and to educational research organizations, normally through uh, institutional partnerships that enable, for example, all the researchers to get access and so on. Um, and so that, 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 if you like, do good work can uh, can happen and that's again why we started planet but we also have to pay for all the satellites that we launched uh, and all the rockets and stuff that are yeah. not so cheap and so turns out rockets um, cost quite so a we bit. do have to, to pay um uh, get people to pay for the data uh, to make that uh, system work and uh, have a sustainable business uh, that keeps better and better data uh, 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 enabled for all of these actors but but yes. i mean you know, I could quickly uh, retort that you just go to planet.com and there's various different ways to um, go and, and access the data. Awesome. Thank you, Will. That, that, was, that was helpful. Gary, sorry, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to add uh, to, to amplify on Will's point. Um, you know, if you take that lens that I offered at the beginning, the sort of uh, narrow way that humans have been thinking about our relationship to the planet, and you realize we give ourselves license to do things. And unless we learn this how, unless we truly deeply take in th those myths, we're just gonna repeat the same practices using buzzwords. You know, the word natural here in the US means exactly nothing now. It was a idea, an advertising concept of the 60s. And now there's ice creams out there that don't change shape when they melt, but they say natural on the label. And a, a term in agriculture that is subject to enormous abuse is no-till. And um, no-till is, is, is the idea that you don't till and it's for to you know, conserve soil, avoid soil runoff. But what it has actually become is an excuse for chemical companies to use more herbicide. And particularly, and, and also there's a lot more water runoff and the, the, it encourages row crops on unsuitable lands, namely slopes. And so we need imaging technology to model on a scale to show the myths that these large chemical companies are advancing. You know, here in the US where we are desperately in need of campaign finance reform, uh, you know, the lobbyists control the, the money and the data. It's this sort of fake news thing. And, and the problem is, is that they, they go out of their way to talk ecologically. But imaging work uh, or technology such as Will is describing here could really shatter that because there's, there's plenty of places where no-till makes a lot of sense, but, it's, but there's also plenty of evidence that it absolutely is the wrong idea in other places. And we could really use an eye in the sky to, to help advance that case. Absolutely. Actually, Gary, Will and I have a, a mutual friend who's working on a project like that, so we should talk about it. Okay. Um, but uh, to my next question is actually to you, Gary, and links to something you were just saying about the erosion of meaning of words. 
Um, and the question I have to ask you is really about the sort of new legal um, ideas that are coming through into New Zealand at the moment around um, watershed protection, organic standards, the debates that are happening in Parliament about having national standards um, on yep. what organic means. So um, if you do have any comments on that, I'd love to hear them because obviously that debate has been had many times in many places. So if you do have got any views, please share. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very, uh, Current. And uh, now as a landowner, I have a deeper appreciation. Um, you know, uh, policy and words matter. And uh, look no further than our country to see, uh, you know, evidence of the abandonment of science, right, uh, in the last uh, four years. And, um, you know, so to your point earlier, Chelsea, this is why markets matter. Because markets are both consumers that create opportunity, but also markets are voters. <laughs> and uh, we need better educated voters. Uh, now in, the, in New Zealand, um, well, let me back up a second. Um, in the US, uh, some of the older folks uh, in, in the cohorts may remember that there was a time, and it was when I started, when we did not have a unified national standard for what organic was. It was the province of small individual certifiers. So Vermont, NOFA, the NAC, one group had one set of standards, a group up in Oregon had another. And, and um, in 1990, a great many of us finally managed to convince Congress to pass a unified standard. Now it took 12 years for it to become law. That's another story. But the point is, is when you look at the actual explosion in the growth of organic, going from the millions to the billions, and it's now a 60 plus billion dollar sector. It was tied to having a national organic standard, a definition of what is and what isn't. And you know, a lot of people are using this word regenerative right now. It's a very dangerous and vulnerable word because there's no law attached to it. Um, so one of the first things that a group of us did uh, in New Zealand, when I started getting very active a bunch of years ago is to meet with uh, Damien O'Connor, uh, your agriculture minister, and uh, uh, work on persuading him and members of parliament that you all need the same benefit. You need a unified national standard. And as you know, as you may know, but folks on this call may not, there is now a bill going through and we actually got you know, a, a, a lot of support behind it. The first pass of the bill uh, went through parliament unanimously, but then it ran into some political uh, obstruction, but it's, there's now going to be a, a new select committee uh, bringing the bill uh, announced on, on November 25th. And this will be a catapult for organic growth because now you'll have, or for growth of the sector, because now everyone will be able to agree on what it is. And I'll just quickly mention one other bill that was recently passed, uh, which is also very promising. And, and Americans on this call can now start to see with jealousy uh, because though controversial, um, the um, Minister of Primary in Industries and the Parliament have now um, passed a, a, a regulations in 2020 uh, called uh, stock exclusion regulations uh, under this new resource management uh, legislation. And this is going to help a lot. Now I can tell you as a landowner, what it really means in practice is that there's actual defined uh, distances that you must keep livestock away from streams and watersheds, which again, the eutrophication problem, I'm sure I don't have to explain. So it's a cost, it's a cost and that's why it's controversial, but it is so overdue and needed. You know, so much of the bad name that dairy uh, has in New Zealand as around the world is really because of a few, shall I say, bad apples, CAFO, a confined animal feedlot operations, which this legislation will address. and. I would also just add one last one, Chelsea, and that is, I mentioned it earlier, I wanna say it again, um, which again, New Zealanders can exhale right now with this government, uh, keeping GMOs out. Uh, you know, we're fighting in the US just to even be able to know what's, where GMOs are, you know, by having it labeled. Uh, but, um, you know, GMOs are another excuse for using Herbicides, 85% of genetically modified crops have been engineered to use, to withstand and therefore allow farmers to use more herbicides. So these are three examples uh, that back up my earlier point and Will's point that when you have um, 
you know, it's not no government, no regulations are perfect. But when you have, let's just say, a more conscious government and also a more active citizenry who want to protect the waters, who wants to support more sustainable ag, then you can really make things happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as you said, a couple of different ways. I mean, everyone is always under the financial incentive system and therefore there's obviously a massive role for a government to play to figure out how to incentivize um, uptake of practices rather than making it always feel like the cost is on the person making the most changes on the ground. So definitely some baby steps there that are very pr um, promising and also still some challenges in regards to cost, both for the consumer and the producer. So yeah, very, very clear what you were saying. Will, I've got a question for you going to your biodiversity loss piece and also linking it with what you said about the um, hyperspectral and very nuanced tools that you have at your disposal in, in the CubeSat Dove fleet. Um, I'm curious, what are the kind of proxy measures for the types of biodiversity that you're talking about? So for example, you made the point of the two things New Zealand could do is uh, monitor um, you know, best practices and the effective best practices in agriculture. And the other thing you mentioned was to be able to measure and witness um, you know, levels of, uh, or, or proxy measures for, I guess, biodiversity uh, taking place over time. So since this is an extremely complex kind of web of life, type of dynamic and it's sort of inherently messy i'm curious you know you keep saying you, you know we can only move towards what we measure but in the case of the biodiversity loss challenge what exactly are you pointing at measuring mm -hmm. yeah well so you have to couple data sets um so there's no one um tool that just solves the whole thing but but i mean the main thing um is just tracking land use change and preventing it um so we know uh, from ground uh, studies uh, where biodiversity is rich, um, mainly, for example, in tropical forests or in coral reefs or in, you know, we know those kind of zones. And we know that if they turn to, you know, say forest turns in agriculture region or um, a coral reef goes uh, from from alive to, to bleached, uh, which isn't actually dead, but in, um, is, um, that's bad, right? So these are the indicators that we need to, to watch. It's, as opposed to, for example, we're not getting a measure of the number of species um, in a spot. Right? Now, having said that, there are some other slightly more detailed proxies than just land use change. That is, is it is there are there trees still there, or did somebody knock it down? And is there a farmer's field? You know, um, there are things like, for example, we can tell bio bio mass, um, although it only gets at the canopy level. Um, we can uh, tell um, uh, different types of um, species um, and, and types in coral reefs um, because of our spectral data. So these are all things based on our spectral data. Talking of which, the next generation of satellites is likely to have even more spectral bands and with more spectral bands you can just start distinguishing more like there's, you know, 15 different species of tree in these, you know, in the, these areas or what have you. So there are ways of getting towards that. It's never going to be perfect. It's always going to need um, cross-referencing with the ground truth. But, but where you do, you can then extrapolate quite easily to large regions. But again, the first order thing is, is measuring literally is, is the field, is, is a field replaced a tree, you know, has a tree gone down? And that's, you know, that's the starting point. Or is the coral reef still there and healthy? Um, and, or is there illegal fishing going on? And, and that is just a visual thing. Like, is there a ship there? Or is the, did the tree go down? Um, and that we can just tell with our visual imagery. Right. Yeah, that makes good sense. Yeah, the, one of the reasons why I think this is sort of a bit nuanced, and I'm sure that you've thought about this plenty, um, my exposure to the United Nations climate work taught me a lot about Lulu CF, you know, land use change uh, policy. And one of the continuous complaints about land use change policy and land use monitoring uh, from indigenous communities around the world is that land use change monitoring is is sort of a bad proxy uh, in the case of, you know, the, like what you were saying about ground truth, the nuanced reality of people living in an environment, et cetera. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of detail there. And I know that you have teams that specifically address that, but if you did want to add anything on that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, absolutely. It is, it is way uh, nuanced and we do have um, people that think a lot more than I do about that. But uh, and my understanding, you're getting towards the edge of my uh, limit of my understanding here, but I, I um, uh, firstly, let me say that, indigenous groups um, do represent a big fraction of the 
key biodiverse regions are under indigenous group uh, people's management. And so, um, in fact, we have some partnerships underway, uh, which are exactly about conserving in collaboration with indigenous peoples, um, biodiverse regions. Um, so it's not a, 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 so that's an important point, I agree. And then, it, yeah, it's definitely imperfect, but it's, um, but there were various limits in the past um, that were made it even more imperfect, which were that these things were only typically measured once a year, and they were typically measured at very coarse uh, resolution because of the satellite limits um, that were there. And just the fact that we've roughly 100x the amount of data flow from space overnight, um, 10x sort of overall uh, imagery by area image per, per day um, of all the sources from La Landsat, uh, NASA to, to Sentinel and the European Space Agency and the EU and, and all the other private sources overnight gives us a, and, and the main thing we've done there is up the area coverage per day. And that basically means coverage times frequency is increased to the point where you, I mean, I see this trend mainly from, from a sort of awareness of what we were doing, screwing up various parts of the environment and ecosystems to um, an action, uh, data that enables action. And, and so those data gaps help that bridge that point, which is the data has got much better at being more nuanced, it, right. but it's not perfect. And so your point remains valid. Yeah, it's a data. It's a uh, it's a self observation meditation at a planetary scale where we get to witness ourselves and then. That's adjust. right. I, I I say like this: the Apollo um, uh, program in, 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 in Apollo seventeen took that incredible Earth uh, rise shot and 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 the blue marble picture earlier in the Apollo program, and those people say galvanized the green movement. It, you know, of course, we knew we were on a planet, but suddenly we really saw ourselves as a you know, a small planet in the vastness of space protected by a thin membrane of the atmosphere. And suddenly we were like, wow, you know, that we woke up a little bit. It was a phase change in planetary consciousness. And your point there about the mirror is where I think it's going now. Now we look up and there's a big mirror <laughs> and we can see ourselves all day. <laughs> it's a exactly. bit ugly, you know, um, and it's the realities of that. Um, but, but, you know, warts and all, but um, by having that real time mirror, we're damn well uh, now uh, uh, cognizant and beyond just the we've woken up to the challenge of a fragile planet. Now we get the data on a daily basis, seeing how we're screwing it up. And so we can actually do something about it. So the, there's a beauty yeah. in that uh, close up observation, even if it's a little bit sad on first um, first view. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. OK, cool. Well, we've got two more questions from me, one for each of you. And in the meantime, I challenge everybody who's on the phone to write in the chat some questions that you want to ask after I'm finished asking those two more questions. We have 20 minutes remaining together. Please use the chat to explore what questions you'll ask. And I've actually got on my notebook in front of me a few from what's been said so far in the chat. So I am paying attention and I will I'll do a little bit of picking and choosing uh, as to digging into questions that I know will be more rich than others. So um, forgive me if your question, question gets missed. Um, hopefully you'll get some value regardless. So question to you, Gary, before we go to the rest of the group. So the question I want to ask is about the scale of implementation of new forms of agricultural practice. And I want to, you know, we talked before about the organic standard, and obviously there's a certain market incentive that goes with um, certification as well. But what are the other kinds of crowbars that we can sort of jam into the machine uh, in the New Zealand context to mm -hmm. radically incentivize these change of practices um, and, and who who's either holding those crowbars now or who should be holding them and who can mm -hmm. actually pick them up off the ground and jam them into the machine and actually start changing some things. So what's your view on that? Well, um, that those, that's a nice bundle of questions that requires about an hour's response, but I'll do my best here. Look, uh, let me first segue from something that you and Will, that in your and Will's exchange. You know, I was one of those people who had the wow moment when I saw uh, soil loss uh, or desertification um, globally from those original satellite images and they zoomed in, this is, you know, in the 70s. And uh, I thought, okay, I was young. I thought, okay, we're, we see it, the data's here. 
now we can be smart, right? We can, like you said, warts and all. And unfortunately, as I then went through my own career, I, I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't seeing the traction that you're asking about, Chelsea. I was, I was seeing it being fiercely debated at the UN and in enlightened environments, you know, uh, with with progressive political folks, but uh, utterly, uh, you know, didn't reach the level of kind of consumer action. And that's the crowbar, uh, in my in my view. Now I speak as a business person, and I believe me, I worship. We I absolutely believe we we must have the data because we must inform policy. And I spent plenty of time on Capitol Hill and it's, you know, you gotta have your stuff or you're not credible. But the crowbar is uh, markets. And um, the, so here in the US, uh, just to put this in perspective, I've, I've mentioned, you know, it's a 60 plus billion dollar sector and I'll get to New Zealand in one moment. Um, so the good news is it's 60 billion up you know, con constant double, uh, a, a compound annual growth rate that is many times faster than non-organic, but it's from a smaller base. The bad news is that it's only about 6% of total US food. And the worst news is it's only about 1.5% of US agriculture, cropland. And uh, the worst news is that we only have about 1% of the entire USDA research budget. So you have this, uh, the, the, the foundational pieces, those levers, those crowbars, you know, we need more research, we need more data, we need more satellite imaging, we need more runoff data, we need more correlations with health data, we need, you know, more funding. But the way you create that is you create human benefit and, and that translates to market. And so what I tell people, and this is, uh, you know, obviously in New Zealand, it's a tiny market. And so it's, uh, um, you know, 5 million people and so forth. So exports do tend to command a disproportionate amount of attention and funding and support. But if you look at China and you look at uh, Europe and you look at uh, the US, the fastest growing exports have been in the better for you space, more sustainable green and so forth, more transparency. And so, uh, I really believe the key is to empower producers to see those markets, to close that gap. Right. I mean, that's, you know, my grand scheme boils down to very simply is there's a lot of demand. Don't you want to meet it? And, right, right, right. and while you do it, you're going to find that you're going to save, you know, lots of money. And I just want to just say one quick example of very local scale. My, my property is very, uh, it's got lots of gullies. And the first thing I've done in, in, in certifying is I've gone in to find, we have some native virgin forest there that I'm working with QE2 Trust to preserve. Uh, but next to it is a bunch of gullies that are all filled with non-natives. And of course, no birds. Uh, you all know this well. The birds live in the native, in the, in the, in the virgin area. Uh, and uh, so we have gone through and removed uh, tens, literally several tens of thousands of non-natives and we're planting wow. natives. But we're also experimenting with different ways of controlling the weed growth after. So in mm -hmm. one, I admit we did before we were certified, we did herbicides because we needed that as a control. But the other ones we're using goats and we're using hogs and we're using other methods. And, and, and we're going to measure those so that we can show farmers and producers, and we're already seeing, it's far less expensive to do it our, our way. Um, yeah. You get cleaner water resulting, et cetera. So you need to educate the producers about the markets. You need to also help them to see the methods. But of course, ultimately you need consumers pulling that through. And mm -hmm. there's a whole lot more consumers in other countries who that's the engine I'm trying to use. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what you're saying is it, it makes sense to me. If you're exposed to both sides of it, it would be probably make you feel a little bit frenetic on any given day, just seeing so much opportunity and not seeing these worlds meeting more readily. So I, that absolutely makes sense. Yeah, and if um, I could just quickly, Chelsea, say one last thing. So yes. I'm a, I've been on the board of a company called Blue Apron, which is a meal kit company. You guys call them meal schemes, I think. And um, we, all of our animal products, and by the way, most of my investing is in non-animal-based agriculture. I agree with you, Will. But, but 
Blue Apron, all of its uh, animal products come from New Zealand. And why is that? Because their consumer, who's an educated consumer, uh, wants to know that it's being grown in, in, uh, on grass. It's grass fed and they understand you know, what those benefits are. And, and so this has now been, um, and we have farmers lined up now to sell us. And COVID's been very good for meal kits, which has in the end been very good for New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very, very interesting point. And that included a comment about the, the phrase educated consumer, which I think is part of that other piece you were referencing as well. Yeah. So, Will, my last question for you, um, that was mine, and then I'll switch to the last three from the audience. New Zealand has a strong environmental sector. New Zealand has a strong agricultural sector, and now it has a new space sector. So given the overlap in the things that we've talked about today, and given specifically your cross-cutting interests in all of the above, um, I'm really interested you know, in examples you might have of the collision between those sectors. And for example, just to kind of whet the appetite here, I'm, I'm very interested also in examples that you have of public-private partnerships with governments um, that really maximize the interface between the space community, the agriculture community, and the environmental management sectors. Um, I believe a member of your team mentioned to me that you have a project with Norway specifically with a public-private partnership interface, um, and that might be an example of a win-win that could be replicated in a New Zealand context or something analogous. So I'm curious, how do we really activate that overlap? Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, the 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 uh, I think the overlap really is there. Um, you have to stay focused on it in the sense that um, you know, uh, again, it's easy to geek out on lots of data and then not, and then forget you know about connecting it to the real problems. And unless it's connected, then then it's not useful. Um, yeah, the Norway uh, forest uh, example is probably the one that my colleague was mentioning to you, uh, Chelsea. So basically, this is a uh, a, a partnership uh, to track um, all the forests in the tropical regions of the world. I, I mentioned it briefly earlier. So um, at an individual tree level uh, on a regular basis to help prevent deforestation. So basically this is for 64 of the tropical countries, basically the whole tropics. Um, and uh, and, and, and uh, it, it's in partnership with Norway uh, that's basically funding it. Um, Together with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which is what monitors, uh, is, despite the title, they also do uh, forestry as well as agriculture for the UN, and um, um, and yeah, there is a novel partnership where the uh, government is funding it. Um, the Norwegian government is funding it so that the UN can access it, so that a bunch of NGOs can access it, so that those nations can access it. Their forestry ministries. Uh, and at the same time, some of it, a limited amount, becomes a public good, which enables scrutiny from everyone else. Um, so if you like, it gets access to all the people that need to have access to the actual job of preventing deforestation in those countries. And there's a part of it that enables other countries to look at them, um, other the press to look at it, and other the, you know, civil society, outside the critical NGOs that are even part of the project to access it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a pretty interesting project and the kind of thing we want to replicate uh, for other projects. Another one that I can mention is on coral reefs. I mean, I did mention that, that how we're doing the tracking of the coral reefs and, and that was actually funded by a foundation, also puts a fair bunch of the data online in an open format, um, but mainly the aggregate stuff uh, so that it doesn't just destroy the business value for planet, but at the same time enables the public good piece of it that we think is so important to do with protecting coral reefs. And then final and third, third and final example I'll give is in the area of uh, forest fires. Um, uh, we've been doing a fair bit of work um, uh, here in California, um, looking at um, uh, helping try and prevent mega fires, which are bad for, of course, biodiversity, bad for climate and, and uh, bad for humans as well. Um, and um, although we tend to only focus on the latter, um, you know, the bushfires in Australia killed, you know, over a billion animals um, there. It's a real tragedy. Um, but anyway, for places like California and, 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 and Australia, we just did this thing called the California Forest Observatory, which literally maps every tree in California. Um, it's for two purposes. One is to tracking the extent of the fires 
uh, during the uh, during the fire season to enable the firefighters real time information to help uh, their resource uh, allocation, and then, um, but perhaps just as importantly, it looks at the uh, fodder for future fires uh, to help them with preventative work outside of the right. uh, fire uh, season, like making lanes and 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 basically these the mapping is what enables them to have smarter resource allocation outside the fire season. Um, yeah, I'll share yeah. those links in the in the chat, actually, if you want. Awesome. Thank you. Will, just to follow up, someone on the um, Q&A tool has asked us a question about not only applying the data and capacity of existing satellite technology, but also thinking about how could New Zealand be a global, global leader in the development of the technology itself? Um, uh, so both on the creation end. Of which hmm? technology? Of which technology? I think the... So you were commenting on satellite imagery specifically, but since we have a burgeoning new space sector in New Zealand, I mean, what would you like to see it create that would be complementary to all of those things you were talking about? We've got the chipsets work happening at Auckland University, but is there any other key pieces of that puzzle that you think would be valuable for the New Zealand space industry to add to the consortium of things that exist today? Absolutely. Um, I can give a very um, um, a, a concise answer to that, I think, which is, data and analytics. Um, the big value add, add here is in all the, the, the uh, services that you can build out of this data. The, the combining of the, our data and other people's data sets, local data sets, um, you know, in, in agriculture they use soil moisture together with our data together, weather data and pile it into to help. But the same is true for biodiversity, the same is true with sustainable ag, the same is true is with protecting conservation, the same is true. So, I would encourage uh, the focus around the data. Um, right. The, and the value we, uh, can sit on top of that. Yeah, yeah so mean, we, need, we need someone to start a machine learning boot camp. Uh, that'd be great. So that New Zealand can have uh, immense capacity in this data area. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 and look, the rockets and even the satellites are sexy things and they garner a lot of attention. And, and look, you know, um, I, it's exciting to me too, but I think the data is in an absolute revolution. The rockets are in a, a sort of evolution and it's interesting with nano rockets, with SpaceX doing reusable rockets. Wow, there's some changes. But let me tell you, roughly the rocket uh, costs have come down per kilogram, two to four X at best. The capabilities that we're putting in each kilogram into a rocket has changed by a thousand fold overnight in the last few years. And the data they're generating has changed by orders of magnitude as well. So the revolution is not in the it's so much in the rockets and the and and the, and the satellites as the data and the services that come on top of that. And I think that's the exciting area of fruit now. Um, if you like, we have the rockets, we have the satellites. Um, it's it's in the data and the and, and the value added pieces that can service the real things on the ground. That's where people. It's slightly less sexy, but with machine learning and all these data sets, I think it's it's huge. Yeah, and the supply chain uh, in regards to that thousand fold modification as well. Um, a couple more questions before we close out. Um, and these maybe can be quick fire so we can get through a few of them. So Gary, a quick fire one for you. Netherlands is, the, is a tiny country uh, that is now the second largest exporter of food in the world by being the center of industrial scale, fully automated, organic controlled environmental agriculture. Could New Zealand be the Netherlands of the APAC region? <laughs> well, I go all the way back to my mythology. Uh, the problem here is on a total footprint basis, uh, it's a disaster. Uh, there's more chemical use per hectare uh, in New Zealand, I mean, in the Netherlands, particularly in the flower production area. But uh, look, uh, we do need to be efficient and effective, but it goes to Will's last point. We need data analysis. Uh, you know, I'll just maybe this is because time doesn't allow me to go into all that I'd like to say about that. I'll just tell you a little anecdote that might be helpful here. I chair this uh, group in the U.S. called Organic Voices, and we're trying. And the, the number one obstacle that we have as companies, these are the largest companies in the organic business. So, number one obstacle we have is consumer confusion, because so many of the conventional producers want to do. They want to confuse. They call it natural, they call it, you know, regenerative, they call it, you know, fair trade. And, 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 we, and we spent years trying to get this right. And we finally figured out all we needed to do. Because if we say it's chemical free or less chemicals than 
somebody splits hairs or we find ourselves in court, all we said, all we, we built a campaign around a very simple statement, which is oh, over 700 chemicals are prohibited when you see the organic seal. Right. That's what the markets need to know. And, right. you know, we have a lot to, the Netherlands question, it, it, it means we need, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of analysis needed here and a lot of educating, but to be very simplistic about it, that having the organic seal, that's what it means and everything else doesn't mean that. So right. that's what I talk about moving markets. Yeah, yeah. And there's a quality versus quantity thing that you just mentioned sort of embedded in what you just said as well. I do wanna keep a couple of more quick fires going yeah. before we close. Um, quick comments on uh, the Biden administration. Any top level comments in regards to your hopes, what you expect from the Biden administration in regards to the types of measures that we've talked about today and yeah. whether the Biden administration will have any effect on what we're seeing in these sectors? Oh, well, it has to because we're bringing science back. I mean, all, his, his fourth appointment is a, is, is a climate czar, right? Somebody who actually right. knows the science. Yeah. Uh, just, just, I mean, one of the great problems of the last four years is the number of policy, uh, number of scientists actually out of government now and we've got to bring them back. So I have high hopes for at least getting back into the world of science and facts yeah. and objective facts. But, but I would also say very quickly that uh, you can bet rest assured climate is going to be, uh, you know, top of the agenda. But I also want to say very, very fast, we have to get out of this partisan this, you know, climate, biodiversity, these are not partisan issues. And we need to find ways in, in many topics in the US to bridge the divide. Um, one of the early signs that I like about this administration is it looks like he's gonna be bipartisan. Right, we, we, we he's can't a deal maker. Folks over there who don't believe and the folks over here who do, we'll get nowhere. Yep. yep, yep, good point, good point. All right, Will, any words on that before we move on? No, it's just shocking uh, to see um, uh, there's something strange going on. They, they seem to be appointing people that have uh, a competence in these relative domains. I, I don't know Amazing. what's going on. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like the Canadian cabinet. Everyone who holds a portfolio has a master's degree in that subject or something. And I was like, wow, this is a revolution. Shock horror. <laughs> yeah, people very good. <laughs> know something about the domains that... Oh, exactly. Yeah. Very, very good. All right, my friends, we are coming to a close here. Um, I do want to check both Gary and Will, if you have any final rounding out comments that you want to make about your whole experience on this discussion today, just a couple of minutes each or less, because we only have three remaining. That would be wonderful if you do have any closing little words. Gary, why don't you go first? Yeah, and I'm just going to stay narrowly a capitalistic here about my, 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 my formula that markets drive uh, change. Look, uh, there's still a lot of challenges to building a really successful transition to a you know, robust, organic, sustainability, regenerative sector. Uh, and nobody should be fooled that it's like a automatic. If you're green, uh, you, you win, right? You, we've got to deliver on taste and functionality. Good news is that most organic tastes better. Uh, you got to be packaged for greenness. We've, we, you know, my dream for yogurt is when you finish eating the yogurt, you'll eat the cup. We have to get back to cradle oh, and cradle. Um, I want to eat the cup. Okay. Well, I have one for you to try. Think of the yes. ice cream cone and we'll talk about it. Uh, we have to provide, we have to be priced fairly, right? We have to provide value, especially with these economies all taxed. So these are prerequisites to get you in the game. What, the thing, what I want to leave our audience with is that the key to all of this is authenticity, but the real key is how we communicate and that's transparency. And the and social media and digital media can be your advantage. I had 500 people on a farm tour the other day in COVID. They were in their homes, but they were walking, they were you know seeing the soil, they were talking to the farmers. We have many, many tools available that we never had uh, before this to help explain, be more transparent. People make choices based more on emotion and heart than on head. And, right. uh, and that's and a different type of transparency as well. 100%. And digital technology it. allows us to co convey emotion. So yeah. Beautiful. Gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will, any last words? Well, look, it's been a enjoyable conversation. I just said I, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, for how we can uh, turn this uh, uh, biodiversity crisis around. Um, it's the crisis of our age. I, I hope it motivates everyone here. Um, 
I think we know what we need to do. Um, there's only really two things we need to do at a global level, uh, more conservation of the forests, of the key biodiverse regions, of marine protected areas, and sustainable food and fishery systems. Um, that's really it. And at a consumer level, you can help, of course, um, by um, eating more plant-based diets, flying less, and voting for, for conservation um, uh, 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 keen politicians or aware politicians. And you know, so we know what we've got to do, and we've got to do it uh, really quickly. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm hopeful that the coronavirus situation inspires us um, that we can make big changes in short order uh, when we decide to prioritize it. And now's the time to prioritize it. Thank you, beautiful. Paula, please put up the poll for all attendees to fill out their views. Um, if you are still here, please do uh, submit your views. To close and to honor the immense wisdom and experience of these two incredible human beings, Gary and Will, I just wanna offer a very short waiata, which is a song. Um, this waiata is to acknowledge you, to acknowledge the work that you do, to acknowledge the effort that you put in and the amount of passion and care that you bring. E tu kaekatea, hei fakapai ururoa, afi mai afi atu, tato tato e, tato tato e. Kia ora The translation is: Stand like the kaekatea to brave the storms, embrace one another. We are one together. And I see you both as tall trees in this beautiful rainforest that we call our community. So thank you for the strength that you bring despite the storms we are weathering as a global community. I'll close mm -hmm. briefly with a karakia and then we will turn off the webinar. Unuhia, unuhia. Unuhia ki te uru tapunui. Kia watia, kia mama, te ngako, te tinana, te wairua, ki te ara tangata. Koire ra rongo, fai kia hia ake kerunga, kia tina, kia tina huye taikie. This means draw on the sacred supremeness, the God of peace. Fully immersed, we draw together, together, together. Kia ora everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you again, yeah. Will and Gary, for your immense contributions. Thank you, Michelle and Paula and Ants and everyone behind the scenes making this possible. There are so many other sessions for you all to join. Please enjoy the rest of the experience of this incredible springboard. <laughs>